Well, today I'm joined by Roy Wang, who is a third year medical student at Barts in the London. But apart from being a very outstanding medical student, is a phenomenally gifted pianist. Roy, it's lovely to be joined by you today. Lovely to be joined by you too, Paul. And, and Roy, you've been on placement, I think, um, a lot of this year. That's right. I've been in Colchester for three months now. Just come back home for the Easter. You're going to be telling us about the Yellow River Concerto, yeah. um, which is probably the most famous Chinese concerto that we know in the UK. Is it so famous in China? Um, yeah, so the Yellow River Concerto, it was actually composed in 1939 at the kind of the peak of the Sino-Japanese War. And what happened then was at the time the J Japanese invaded China and China was actually on the brink of defeat and of losing the war. So the composer, Shen Xinghai, he wanted to write a piece of music to try and boost the morale of the Chinese people. And he wanted to like, stimulate a feeling of patriotism, nationalism, and to like fend off the enemy, basically. So he came up with this piano concerto called the, the Yellow River Piano Concerto. Um, it's about the Yellow River, which is the second longest river in the country. And legend has it, he actually wrote this piece of music in only six days. And he apparently sat in a cave and watched a very large waterfall and he was really inspired by like the power of the Yellow River. And what's quite interesting is it's really one of the first attempts by a Chinese composer to take influence from Western orchestration. And, but it's also combining some traditional Chinese instruments as well. That is one of the things that strike, uh, struck me immediately because um, uh, the orchestration is absolutely Western in style, but of course he's using the fundamentally the pentatonic scale um, yeah. and uh, all of those aspects. So the harmony, so you get a real unusual um, combination of this. The, the orchestra is a Western orchestra, isn't it, that's used? That's correct, but as you'll soon see when I demonstrate, there's also some traditional Chinese instruments that have been put in very special locations to catch the interest of the audience as well. Yes. So it's a very, very interesting combination, and honestly, I've never heard the piano sound like this before. So. Tell me, um, was this a revolutionary piece uh, at the time uh, in the way that it was combining uh, Western styles with with Chinese music and Chinese traditional music. Yeah, absolutely. It caused quite a stir at the start because Chairman Mao, of course, he was regulating the, he was even regulating the music that he wanted the people to hear. And at the start, he was quite reluctant because he didn't want any Western influence in the work, especially during the Cultural Revolution when he was trying to abolish everything Western and start his, his way of communism. He didn't want anything to do with the Western world. So at the start, it was quite controversial. But then actually what happened was Chairman Mao's wife heard the composer playing the piano in the streets and she was like really taken aback by the piece. And so they commissioned it and eventually Chairman Mao was, came on board the piece. It's but, extraordinary how uh, politics so often informs uh, art and vice versa because um, artists of course often rebel against the political environment. Um, or they, they have to uh, kowtow to it in, in many ways. Um, but of course, music uh, is one of the most important ways of changing minds and winning hearts, isn't it? Definitely. Um, so it's a, there is an irony that to raise the spirit, the national spirit of China, uh, there is this work that is so heavily influenced by... Um, the West. It absolutely, it's, it's quite, quite extraordinary actually. Um, now tell us about the actual work itself. Um, so it's actually in four movements. It's based on a cantata originally, so there was vocals before. And this is actually a piano concerto arrangement of the piece. Should we start with going through each movement? Would you like with that? Absolutely. Okay? So the first movement, tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so the first movement is called the Song of the Yellow River Boatman. 
and what's what it's trying to capture here is like the huge waves of the Yellow River and the power of the waves. We wanted to capture this with like very virtuosic arpeggios and chromatics. So the piece opens off with this very stormy cadenza. The left, the right hand is basically playing A7, but the left hand is playing C sharp diminished. So it creates something like this. It's wonderful to hear you playing the piano so well, Roy. After three months of not having access to a piano, that's a, a brilliant start. Just goes to show how good you are. Um, Love it for me to hear that. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing you playing Rap 2 when we finally can actually bring the orchestra and everybody together. Um, that is absolutely Western music, isn't it? Absolutely. You could hear that maybe in Rachmaninoff or something, or Prokofiev, something, anything really. Absolutely. Very Western influenced. So where where do we go to China in this music, um, uh, in that first movement? Yes. And how does he quite... conjure up this this um, this song of the uh, uh, of the boatman? Yeah. So straight after this cadenza, this is where the the main motif was introduced, and it's it's quite a, it's a very very nationalistic theme, I'd say. So the, the main theme is how he developed this is. And this just goes on and on in various um, various um, variations. Yes. And of course, that's when we hear the pentatonic scale, isn't it? Or in the melodies. Yeah, so the melody is... And, and for those who do not know what the pentatonic scale is, uh, and they want to try a pentatonic scale, they could go to a piano and they could play the black notes, couldn't they? Yes, they could. So. Uh, but that does give a particular characteristic, doesn't it, that pentatonic scale? Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about the first move. How does it develop? So after the first theme is introduced, a new theme that's quite related to the first theme comes in about halfway through. And the next theme is... change of atmosphere compared to the start. Absolutely. Um, now tell us about the the second movement, the Ode to the Yellow River. Yeah, so the second movement is called the Ode to the Yellow River and it's the slow movement of the piece. It's mainly yes. just paying homage to like the beauty, the history of the Yellow River and it begins with a really very rich tenor cello melody. May I ask you why is the Yellow River, I mean apart from the fact it's such a, a a large river, but why is the Yellow River so important in China? I mean, the Yellow River is important in terms of its history, first of all. Um, it was used um, in various invasions in the past, in wars, and also it's very important for China in terms of the economy and its growth as well, as a very big, like a shipping, shipping zone. Okay, are you going to play us a little bit of the slow movement? Yes, absolutely. So I'll play you a piano reduction of the cello part, first of all, and then I'll play when the piano also enters as well. So here's how the movement opens with the cello melody.
rich, nostalgic kind of melody. Now that, of course, is absolutely Chinese in, in, in style of melody and, and that. And these are traditional melodies, aren't they? Yes, so this is a traditional folk melody. Most of these melodies that I'm playing today are traditional folk melodies from many centuries ago. And would these be very familiar to uh, the Chinese audience? Oh, absolutely. I think most, most Chinese people would have heard these melodies in their childhood before. So that is where um, the composer is using um, these traditional ideas and the traditional tunes that people will be able to relate to, to, to move them. Uh, just as Bach did, obviously, with his chorales in, in uh, his passions. That was the way of engaging people with something that was so familiar, directly familiar with them. Absolutely. Okay. So then we go on to the third movement, uh, the Yellow River in Anger. Um, tell us about this piece or this movement. Well, it's a bit paradoxical that it's called the Yellow River in Anger because it actually begins very, very gently, actually. It begins with a melody played by a Chinese flute called a Dizu. And this is what the melody sounds like at the start. takes over with a little cadenza here. So when does it get angry? So it gets angry later on, but before it gets angry, there's quite a it's quite a interesting bit that it's mimicking a traditional Chinese instrument called the guzhen. Um, oh yes, now the guzhen is one of the uh, the oldest uh, instruments, isn't it, of, in Chinese uh, um, tradition? Uh, that's a an instrument that is fundamentally a, a sort of large soundboard, isn't it, a wooden soundboard with strings that are pulled over and plucked uh, like a sort of harp lying on its side. Exactly, and I've never, this is a very interesting extract, but I've never really heard a piano sound like this before. It's very delicately ornamented and it's really quite, quite, be quite beautiful actually. <laughs> interesting ornamentation that you'd never really hear in Western music, trying to mimic the plucking of the strings. It finally gets angry. What does that anger represent? Um, the anger represents basically the wrath of the Yellow River, the power of the Yellow River, because it's quite, it's very large, very, um, with very large waves. And it's just, it doesn't represent anything political, I don't think, but it's more just the physical power of the river. And so perhaps the word anger is inappropriate. Would it would it be would there be a, a sort of the strength or the or the yeah. purpose yeah. Is, is a better word. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then we get to the, the final fourth movement, defend the yellow river. We've been working toward this, haven't we? Uh, systematically uh, and psychologically. Mm. So this is a finale of the piece and it's it's probably the most politically charged movement. As you can probably tell from the name, Defend the Yellow River, it's referring to defending the Yellow River against the Japanese invasion. And what we have in this movement is a, it's a very, it's a march, essentially. It's a very, very patriotic march. You can imagine the Chinese soldiers marching to this. So we've 
got this. Well, that certainly is, um, that, that conjures up the atmosphere of Chairman Mao, doesn't it, as we, as we hear it. How do people look back at that time uh, at associating music like this? Back in China, this piece is actually interesting. It died down for a few years after the Cultural Revolution, which was quite understandable because they were trying, Chairman Mao was essentially trying to eradicate all of previous Chinese culture. But then it actually came, it took a resurgence into the uh, concert hall around 1980 time. Yes. Now it's actually a very, very popular piece back in China again. It's regularly performed by the famous Chinese pianists like Lang Lang, for yes. example. And uh, I, know, I know there's a very exciting recording uh, with Yundi Li. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there is a sort of now a, a, an ability to look at the piece um, as it was probably originally intended by the composer as a, as a, as a work of patriotism but not a work that was used in the, in the form of propaganda that it probably was or was certainly used um, sure. uh, at the time. Um, do you feel that um, now in the, in, in the East, there is such a strong influence of Western classical music? Do you feel that the traditional Chinese music is sometimes being lost or sacrificed um, because of that Western influence, or do you think the balance is being somehow maintained? That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, from what I'm aware, like in the Chinese conservatoires, there is definitely a lot of Western influence. The way they teach the students is like using Western theory, 12 tone, but very rarely like, pentaton very rarely like using pentatonic scales. But I think these composers, especially like the emerging generation of Chinese classical composers, they're trying to employ sort of fusion style, perhaps using Western structure of music, but still maintaining some, the use of like Chinese instruments, for example, within a Western context. And an example of a composer who does that is Qigong Chen. Yes. He certainly uses a Western orchestration, but he also uses traditional Chinese instruments as well in his works. Curiously, uh, on the opposite way, we have been influenced by the East. Uh, and I think that sort of coming together has goes back to Debussy, then through to Messiaen, and of course Messiaen, who taught Qigong Chen, probably well many many Eastern composers wanting to study with Messiaen because of that sort of empathy with the the Eastern East Far Eastern traditions. Um, Roy, it's lovely to talk with you uh, about this important music. Uh, it's lovely to hear you play the piano again uh, and I'm looking forward very much as I'm sure we all are to hearing you playing in public uh, and particularly Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. At some point it will be the first thing that we do. Brilliant, I'm looking forward to that for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you Paul.